Welcome to this week in the world of wrestling. Welcome to TwitWow, the best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. And this is our Monday Night Raw Review. And this really was, for all intents and purposes, a filler episode of Raw. The 4th of July, it was all about celebrating the holiday. I will give WWE this. We got two Battleground matches announced, so at least they still furthered the pay-per-view. We got the main event storyline progressed a little bit, but really everything was about promoting America and all of its glory. So, yeah, I really didn't care too much for this show. Ash, what did you think of it? Let's all celebrate that one time when a bunch of white people fought each other for the sake of owning land that, that wasn't even theirs in the first place. Yeah! My sentiments, exactly. So I'm guessing you weren't too thrilled with this Raw either. It was like a 5 out of 10 for me. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually, yeah, I think I'd sign on to that score. Because they did a little bit, but not nearly enough to be like, oh my god, this was a can't-miss Raw. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were like two, I think, like eight or nine out of ten segments, but everything else was like six or under. I completely agree with that as well. Really, the most worthwhile thing, like not a part of Raw specifically, because again, there were like maybe one or two standout segments, was the announcement that on SmackDown, which way to promote SmackDown, guys, and I mean that sincerely, actually, we're going to find out Lesnar's SummerSlam opponent. So that'll be an interesting uh, conversation later in the podcast. But with that said, let us get right into our first segment, Heat of the Night. And you know what? (laughs) Okay, floor is yours. No, I was I was just joking. Just every week, Charlotte, when she gets mic time, is a heat of the night for me. Well, I was even getting ready to say, I have no heats of the night. I have no nitpicks. I mean, this is the kind of episode where they could have stepped on plenty of minds, you know, at least in my personal view. The biggest one, I honestly thought Titus O'Neil was going to win the U.S. Championship tonight, and that was going to be a big heat of the night for me. But that didn't happen. So you know what? For as boring and as bland as this role was, it's just going to be another one. Whereas Twitwow said in the past, it's meh. But I'm not malicious about it, so there you go. You're not malicious about Zack Ryder pinning Cesaro? Absolutely not. You know, look, you had to imagine it was going to happen. He was on Team USA. Cesaro got distracted, taking out his other teammates. So at least it was written believably. I can't flare up at Zack or get pissed off. I mean, it is what it is. If you didn't expect that going into this, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I was bracing myself for the worst, so... There you go. You know, it's sad because I can't even really disagree with you. This wasn't even really a show where it's like you get done with it and you're just angry and fuming and you just want to vent because of how bad it was. It was just a show that was like, oh, so they're not trying this week. Okay, well, maybe next week. (laughs) Exactly. You know, I mean, that really is what it is. So with that spirit in mind, let us get right into our Monday Night Raw Review And we open up in, well, I guess catering here. You know, with all the superstars, we know that there is a big Team USA versus Team, what they would be called multinational, uh, about, you know, eight on eight kind of matchup here. And, you know, everybody's just kind of sharing the catering area, eating. But it doesn't take long for the whole thing to devolve into chaos, Ashton. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course, because the vaudevillains try singing, and that's just the best way to ruin a party. And then... Of course, you have The Miz come out and, well, he's The Miz. (laughs) Yeah. He's obnoxious and he yells at everyone about how this should be about him and how this is going to be ruined and they're not even allowed to have food fights on SmackDown, or they're not even allowed to have these holiday parties on SmackDown anymore, and then he plugs the move to Tuesday nights and that kind of stuff. But then, because he says we're not going to have a food fight, of course, we end up getting a food fight. And everyone except for Kevin Owens, Cesaro, and Apollo Crews participate. Uh, Kevin Owens ducks under a table, the smart one, and Cesaro and Cruz just kind of chill out, sitting in their chair, getting slaughtered with food and not really doing anything, and then we get to a point where Heath Slater is kind of, you know, over-obnoxious as usual, and Big Show and Kane have this big confrontation where they end up doing, like, choking each other from opposite sides of a table, and then Heath Slater says something about them, and they chokeslam him through a table, and then by the end of everything, 
Cesaro and Apollo Crews shake hands, and Kevin Owens, when everyone clears out, gets out from under the table, only to be pied in the face. I heard everything you said, but the only thing I could keep thinking about while you were talking is how even on a filler episode of Raw, Kevin Owens, Kevin Owens still manages to be the star of the fucking thing. <laughs> yes. Because... Between this, the backstage segment he would have with Team Multinational later in the night, and how he performed in the main event. My fucking... Honestly, I'm going to say it right now, and I apologize to everybody jumping the gun. I have two people that I think Lesnar's going to face at SummerSlam. Kevin Owens is my subjective pick, and I've been hearing rumors of Owens anyway, so that doesn't help a guy like me one bit. I would love to see Lesnar Owens at SummerSlam. This guy puts his back into everything, even on a shitty episode of Raw like this. <laughs> Unbelievable. So good. You really think they're gonna do Owens versus Brock? No, 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 no. Let me, let me, let me stop you right there. So there's no misunderstanding. I don't think they're gonna do Owens Brock, oh. but that Owens is the guy I really want. Oh. Like I really want them to do Owens like because his see and the guys is... plural that I really want are Cesaro and Samoa Joe. Yeah, I know. I saw Cesaro and Samoa Joe. I think maybe our good friend Lee tweeted that out, or somebody tweeted Cesaro and Samoa Joe. But I did. I did. I was the first person well, to bring it up. You were the first person. I thought I saw somebody else tweet it. So I know those are names that have been floated around. Yeah. Um, to me, it comes down to Kevin Owens, and I think Randy Orton could make a surprise return. I know you kind of um, put that down on Twitter. You didn't think Orton was going to be back in time. I disagree. I think Orton could maybe have that kind of surprise return kind of thing. Plus, and here's the thing, too, being quote-unquote objective. I mean, SummerSlam is Randy Orton's event. I mean, 2004 won the world title, 2005, Undertaker, 2006, Hogan, 2007. Seeing it seems like every year at SummerSlam, when he's healthy, he at least does something worthwhile. So it doesn't get any more worthwhile right now in 2016 than facing Brock Lesnar, in my opinion. So, Yep. So, yeah, I mean, just a fun little food fight. Kevin Heat Owens slip. is the king, as always, I might add. Exactly, exactly. And just that's adding much... on to you what you were saying earlier. Absolutely. And, yeah, that's the food fight for you. So uh, uh-huh. anything else you want to say about it? Up next, we had the National Anthem, as sung by Lillian Garcia. I muted my television during this. Up next after that, first match of the night, Rusev versus Titus O'Neil. Rusev wins, and I'm ecstatic absolutely Rusev he and even kicked out of the clash of the titus oh and i was even gonna say you know i have to give this match credit because it was like around a six minute match and i i'm never gonna be a big fan of titus everybody should know that rusev is definitely in my top 10 right now and i i thought he did great here i thought the false finish with the clash of the titus really kicked the match up a little bit and then rusev doing the two kicks to titus's head and then the accolade i felt like it was a great finishing touch and titus even had that oh can i power through it kind of moment but he didn't and then rusev gets on the mic happy birthday america god this country sucks so bad you tell him rusev so i was very happy to see him retain the championship great stuff yeah, man. And if you don't believe us when we say this country sucks, look at our presidential nominees. Exactly. That's all there is to that. <laughs> uh, uh, anything else you want to say about this match? No, I don't think so, man. I think we can move on already to the social outcasts. I'm going to let you take this, though, because I'm pretty sure you actually did see this. I, I did see it, and I really wish you didn't feel this to me, because, God, this was painful. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I honestly, I think I might have had the TV on mute during the commercials, and I forgot to unmute it by the time the outcasts were out. So I didn't hear anything they said. I just heard what Enzo and Cass said. Oh, oh, funny that you remember to unmute when the good talkers really come out and do their oh, thing. I mean, don't get me wrong. That was entirely intentional. I saw that the uh, social outcasts were on TV, and I just didn't unmute them. I knew it. Goddamn Benedict Arnold leaving me here to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, honestly, and I'm not I'm not even getting around. I don't even really remember oh. anything social outcasts said. I do remember, though, like Enzo and Cass, Enzo specifically, did a great thing where he was just spouting off all the presidents. Uh, Yeah, I remember that. He listed them off all in order, too. Yeah, so impressive. I mean, especially for a guy that's on record, if I'm not mistaken, for saying he never picked up a book in his life, cutting promos like this. Just amazing by Enzo Uh, Amor. I mean, I don't know about that, whether that's true or not. It wouldn't surprise me if it was true, just because he's... You know, he's really all about kind of writing stuff down as he thinks of it and then memorizing it for later. Right. You know, I mean, he writes his own books, basically, not literally, but in sort of like a theoretical sense, because he just writes from what I understand. He just writes a ton of stuff in notebooks to try and remember it, like 
all of his promo material, all these insults that he throws out, that's all from like a freaking notebook that he has. Right, right. So in a uh, sort of, you know, obscure sense, he writes his own books that he reads then. <laughs> I mean, Big Cass was so impressed, he conceded the floor to Enzo. He's like, I, I, I had something planned, I ain't even going to try. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something about Paul Revere or whatever, but man, that, I'm not topping that. <laughs> That's kind of uh, like what we do sometimes, when one of us just says something super perfect to end a segment, and the other one's just like, you know what? You're good, I'm not even going to touch that, let's move on. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and then Big Cass, you know, pulled a twit wow here. It was like, yeah, Enzo, you got this. And uh, then we have our match, and honestly, it was just another by the number squash match, which, you know, I, it seemed like Enzo and Cass, or the realist guys as WWE wants to label them, have been having a few squash matches lately, and I gotta say, from a booking perspective, I like that they did, given what we find out that they're going to be doing later on in the night. I thought that was really cool, because, I mean, me personally, I'm kind of thinking, oh man, are we just going to have like a month or two of them doing nothing but squash matches, but then... Given what they do later, I'm like, oh, man, that's so freaking cool that they're getting that kind of rub. Yeah. So good stuff. Yeah, that's actually a really good point that I never would have remembered to bring up is that, like, we've seen this kind of booking before where, like, they don't really have anything to do for it with these guys, but they just want to keep them on TV. So just, yeah, let's, let's just put them against jobbers and have them get squashed every now and then or have them win squashes every now and then. But I don't know. It's nice to see WWE doing this and kind of doing the fake out and then being like, no, 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 no. This is not the end of the night for Enzo and Cass. It's cool. Especially given, and see, this is where, I mean, I'm not going to include you into this. I mean, you could speak for yourself, but for me, with my cynicism, and you know I even said aloud, oh, uh, I bet you the Usos are going to be a part of this. And you were like, oh, hell, you're probably right. Yep. So to know they went the opposite direction, you know, really cool by WWE. Look, we can give them shit a lot, and, you know, I think 100% of the time it's deserved. But when they do good, you know, you and I are also on top of that as well. And WWE did very well here. Yeah, it's weird because this really did feel just as far as, like, you know, match results and kind of like the send the crowd home happy factor and stuff like that. It felt like a house show, but there were some really good decisions made on this show. I would agree with you there. Absolutely. I mean, you got Rusev winning, beating Titus, and hopefully putting Titus out of the U.S. title picture forever. Yes. You've got Enzo and Cass being added to that feud, which is great. You've got, you know, the, the whole Ambrose-Rollins thing kind of coming out back-to-back -back and having the little weird moment between the two. That was interesting. You've got the amazing Xavier Woods stuff that we got later on, and I mean... Let's not allow ourselves to forget that we had some pretty good women's action tonight. And the decision that I'm referring to now is specifically the decision to actually use Summer Rae as an in ring worker. I know, right? It's about time she got some shine. <laughs> right, though? So um, after Enzo and Cass win against Bo Dallas and Curtis Axel, if you couldn't tell, I'd been stalling up to this point because we got a Charlotte promo. Yeah, so now, because you uh, kicked it to uh, me earlier, what did you think uh, about this, Ashton? I despised it, because she's the worst. I, you know what, Natalia, you're awful, but at least most people don't try and act like you're a good talker. People think Charlotte's a good talker. Here's the thing. Was this a great promo? No, but I think Charlotte did some good things here. Specifically, she did get the crowd to champ a little bit, so we saw a little bit of crowd manipulation by Charlotte, which I liked. Anybody can do that, though, because it's Sasha freaking Banks. I mean, probably, but, you know... You could have did... some random little kid come out of the crowd with Jerry Lawler and be like, Sasha Banks! Or, you no, know, it was, we want Sasha! And they would all chant along with the kid. See, it's funny, because to me, Charlotte... I don't know. She she looked a bit more comfortable, but I do agree. She has to tone it down. She doesn't have to scream every word. Can I also point out that the first thing that she did was woo like her dad to pander to the audience because she know you know like she's a freaking heel. <laughs> yeah, I still don't get. I see again. I feel like this promo was a step in the right direction in some ways, but she still has a long way to go to me. I don't know. I'm hoping she can get it down soon. I'm not really all that hopeful, especially when you compare it to what Sasha Banks did here. Yeah. And Sasha's just cooking on all levels, dude. It's really a shame. I mean, I'm glad she's back now, and I guess nobody even noticed. But that little concussion that she had that took her out for that little bit of time, I'm just glad she's back now and she's over it. Because now I'm really hoping she can stay healthy and just reap all the benefits of how freaking over she is. It it's... is amazing to me how delusional the WWE is because, like, the people that they handpick to be like the face of their, whether it's company or women's division, like how do you even arrive at that conclusion? 
Of what? Having Charlotte be your champion? Roman and Charlotte being the representatives of your company. Nepotism? You would think that it wouldn't be that strong, but I guess it is. I mean, yeah, right? Cause but if nepotism you're... was that strong, you'd think Natalia would have been pushed more. Or Tamina. <sighs> Well, you figure, well, uh, Tamina, yeah, I think you have a strong case there. Natalia was going to be like, maybe they have a secret hatred for the hearts or something. But That's Tamina, true. yeah. But Tamina, yeah. Yeah, that, that is a bit of But then again, uh, maybe they wanted to push Tamina, but didn't she get injured or something or they felt like it wasn't clicking? Because I almost feel like there was part of the movie that wanted to push her. I don't know. But then she know. just couldn't handle it. I don't know, man. But their decision making as far as who they see as top stars and who they see as good hands needs a serious reworking. I think it's 99% lineage and appearance and 1% actual talent and work ethic. You know, if what we heard was true, that, oh, we're just going to rein Sasha in this way, the cheers get so loud and so way, which is still backwards to me nonetheless. But, you know, just let the heels do their thing and then they'll just be begging like, oh, please, Sasha, come and save us. Even though I don't agree with that logic, she's here now, and they better stick with it all the way. Have her win ultimately at SummerSlam, because I don't think it'll happen at Battleground. I've been quite clear about that. I don't even think it's going to be a one-on-one match at Battleground. You don't? Honestly, at this rate, I... Here's the thing. I originally predicted that it would be Sasha, Becky Lynch, and Paige versus Dana, Charlotte, and Natalya. I don't think that that's going to happen now just because it seems like they're kind of separating those feuds a little bit more and Paige hasn't been on TV. Right. But I do think that it's going to be Sasha and someone versus Charlotte and Dana. Right. Okay. Or it might even just be Sasha versus Dana where if Sasha wins, she gets a title shot. Uh, Okay. That could work too, certainly. I mean, yeah, to me, the end game is Sasha Charlotte at SummerSlam for the championship. And I would hope and they going to tear the house down. Oh, I believe it. Oh, I absolutely believe it. I, I don't even hope. like Charlotte in the ring, but there is one thing I will not deny about her. And that's that she has amazing chemistry with Sasha. Absolutely. Then again, absolutely. I don't remember anyone that doesn't. So maybe that's just a Sasha thing. <laughs> hey, Sasha's on point, dude. And she's been on point for the longest time. It's not like this is even a recent phenomenon. I think she just keeps getting better and better. And my thing is, like, she better win at SummerSlam. And I would hope with WWE's backwards logic of, oh, you know, less is more kind of thing is how we could sum it up, that then she goes on her monster run with the championship where she ultimately falls to, I would think, Bailey. But, I mean, who knows? That's still pure conjecture at this point. Yeah. So, yeah, not a bad promo segment, but mainly because of Sasha, who cut this amazing promo about what it means to be a boss. Oh, yeah. We didn't even get to that yet because, like, Charlotte was too busy talking shit about Sasha (laughs) and and she doesn't even talk. She yells like she doesn't say anything. She screams everything. (laughs) Right, right. And she was talking about Sasha and she mentioned that Sasha's jealous and how, you know, ever since Charlotte's been in the WWE, she's been succeeding and she succeeds at everything that she puts any kind of, uh, you know, effort into and anything like that. And eventually Sasha does come out and she promptly bitch smacks charlotte from a verbal standpoint yeah sasha just letting charlotte know you know being a boss means going after what you want you know not taking any shortcuts being a boss means uh representing yourself even if nobody else is going to stand behind you to represent you and just all this stuff like how she won't quit how she is the best but not in a cheesy way you know i mean she really made uh, being somebody that's principled, standing by your own convictions, chasing after what you want, sound like the most badass thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, and she lays Dana out, like she said she was going to do if Dana star anything, so you think Dana would have learned by now. She's the one always patting people on the head, and yet she's the real dunce here. So, uh, you know, Sasha puts the boots to her. Then Charlotte tries to get a shot in. She does. Then uh, leans over Sasha and is like, my reign is just beginning because sasha has said and, and this boss the real boss is telling you that your reign as women's champion is over well that was charlotte's retort and then she goes to pick up sasha and slam her uh sasha slides out and gets the bank statement and uh dana brooke is able to pull charlotte out you know before she could tap out and further humiliate herself not that it would have mattered because it was just a segment not a match and sasha stands tall over charlotte yet again so sasha's definitely got the momentum right now 
Which, yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably safe to say that they're not going to put her against Charlotte because if they would and Sasha has all the momentum, it's probably just going to end up being a disqualification finish anyway that leads to some kind of a stip match at SummerSlam. Oh, you know what would be interesting, though? I mean, I, I do like your An reasoning. Iron Woman match. <laughs> yeah, second ever, you know, because NXT Sasha Bailey. But um, what, I, what I find interesting, because Battleground is kind of, in a way, being billed as this pay-per-view of finality in a pre-WWE draft world. I mean, that's why oh, we're doing yeah. St. Owens. Well, no, it's not, though, because SummerSlam is a, a cross-promoted pay-per-view, too. Both brands are going to be representing on that show as well. Well, that that's what, like here's my thing, right? Like they they want to get all these matches out before the draft. They right. may do Sasha Charlotte, and then Charlotte be like, "Oh, I retain the championship," and because of the draft, you know, and maybe Sasha gets drafted to SmackDown, and then Charlotte just feels like, "Oh, I don't have to worry anymore." And then they find some way to bring those two together. Wouldn't be the first time that we've had two superstars from like a separate brand competing for a uh, a championship that like wasn't a world title. So that'd be cool if they found a way to figure that out, kind of you know, spice up the narrative a little bit. Yeah, man. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Yeah. All right. So up next, we had our third match of the night, The Miz versus Dean Ambrose. And as I said on Titwell, I actually really enjoyed this match. This was a much better match than their SmackDown match, I thought. And, John, you pointed out The Miz's psychology. I think both these guys were on point tonight. Oh, absolutely. Look, you know I've been loving Dean Ambrose's champion, and you and I have both. I've uh, been mutually saying for quite a few months now, the Miz, I, he's, he's really completed himself. The, you know, the circle has completed itself. I feel like he's in it with a character that he's comfortable with. That seems like an extension of his real personality and, you know, not to get all sentimental and have feelings cause ew, but, uh, you know, having, <laughs> having, uh, Maurice with him probably makes him feel good. Puts a pep in him in his step because that's his legitimate wife. And they have just great on screen chemistry together. But I have a question for you though. Okay. Because this is the second time now that these two have had a match. And that's fine, because they've been fun matches. You know, that's not the issue here. I have a two-part question for you, kind of like a quasi 30-second hot seat. Um, is Miz going to be on the Battleground card, and you would presume it would be for the Intercontinental title? And if so, who do you think the challenger's going to be? Because there really hasn't been any storyline progression with that icy title for Miz. Honestly, so. I don't think they're going to announce a match beforehand. And when we get there, he's going to do an open challenge, and it's going to be the way that they bring back Neville. Interesting. I like that prediction. I don't know if Neville will actually win, but you know, I don't know if there's anyone in the WWE who's better right now at looking really strong in defeat than Neville. Yeah, I completely agree. I love everything you just said, because here's the thing, dude. We were kind of speculating about it on the last Raw Twitter, you know, last week. I said straight up, well, Kane won the match by count out. So it just seemed to me like the natural progression is okay. Now Miz has to defeat Kane definitively to move on from this crap, but there really hasn't been like any interaction uh, between them since. I mean, they were a part of two, you know, distinct matches tonight where Miz and Kane, you know, as far away from each other as they conceivably could be. So yeah, just to move on from that, first of all, it's a huge relief to me. And second of all, if you could get Neville in the title picture, that would be wonderful. I mean, I know I've been putting my chips for the longest time on Apollo Cruz but he still seems to be very uh, embroiled in a conflict, either with Sheamus or maybe it's shifted to Del Rio now. I don't even know what the hell's going on. So yeah, we Neville might even get like a bit. bait and switch where like Zack Ryder tries to get back in the IC title picture because of his win tonight, which we'll talk about later. That very well could be. That's another excellent point, dude. Well, no, I, I wasn't point. even finished. What I was going to say is the Miz could even do that thing where he comes out at uh, Battleground and he's like. Zack Ryder thinks he deserves a shot at my Intercontinental title, but I disagree. I don't think he deserves anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an Intercontinental Championship open challenge, and the only person who's not allowed to challenge is Zack Ryder, and then it's Neville. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be very interesting, too. So, yeah, I mean, you've Kinda got... Like what uh, Bo Dallas did to Sami Zayn that one time, but then Sami ended up coming out anyway. Right. As... A masked wrestler. I think it was El Locale. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was it. Um, so really, I mean, you you have a Neville return. Uh, you you kind of tease something with Miz and Zack Ryder that would still lead to a Neville return, or they could just do Zack Ryder straight up, given the events of tonight. That wouldn't surprise me either. There's already a pre-established history there revolving around that Intercontinental Championship, so that's an easy go-to thing. So yeah, I like the options that you and I fleshed out here. Good stuff, dude. Yeah, brother. All right, so up next, we had... 
again, we kind of mentioned this in Titwell, kind of a weird segment where Ambrose is rolling out of the ring and Rollins' music hits. And as Ambrose is walking up the ramp, Rollins is walking down the ramp, and Ambrose kind of gives Rollins an at go butt pat on his way past him. But then when Rollins gets in the ring, Ambrose runs after him like he's going to kill him and then gets in the ring, runs right past him, and then runs out of the ring on the other side and joins commentary. Yeah, I love this. I, I thought I, it was I, really cool, but at the same time, like as it was happening, without the hindsight being 2020 factor, I was like, what the hell is going on right now? Right, right, which I think is the feeling that they were trying to elicit from everybody because – Again, you know how WWE, even if you and I don't necessarily agree with it, try and promote this idea, oh, the lunatic fringe, oh, the lunatic fringe, just, you know, they really want to illustrate him as unpredictable. So then he rushes down to the ring like a person would if they're about ready to engage in a brawl, and then he just breezes right past that, and he's like, no, I'm doing commentary. So, yeah, I loved it, dude. A great idea for uh, mind games for Dean Ambrose there. Yeah. So then we got Rollins versus Ziggler. What'd you think of this match? I really like this match. I, honestly, like going into it, I was just kind of sitting back like, oh, whatever. We've seen every Ziggler match there is to see. This isn't going to matter. But it was actually really good. Yeah, man. You know, uh, Ziggler starting off the match, uh, showing off his amateur experience, which, you know, I'm a sucker for. That was some good stuff. Got some cool pins on Seth. And then it just broke down into complete back and forth. They had one great sequence where Dolph, uh, they made a big thing about him finally hitting the super kick on Seth Rollins. And it got like a two and three quarters count because it was so close. I thought that was an excellently done near fall. Um, had a great counter where Seth tried pedigreeing Dolph, but Dolph actually countered it with a fireman's carry into a pin. Uh, I thought that was unique. And yeah, ultimately Seth does win with the pedigree after a little bit, but a very competitive back and forth between Seth and Dolph Ziggler. You know, I don't know. Maybe if Dolph, if that's another one that would get drafted to SmackDown or something, maybe he could have a little bit of a resurgence, too. I just really don't see him doing anything on a brand like Raw. But he had a really fun matchup here against Seth. And, yeah, I mean, these two have a little bit of history. And they made a big thing like, oh, Dolph requested this match. And yet Seth beat him anyway. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, so after the match, we had these promos where Rollins was cutting a promo about Roman and how Roman was handed everything and threw it all the way, and Rollins worked harder than anyone else, and basically a babyface promo, but because he's cutting Roman down, the WWE thinks that this is going to get Rollins heat, but it's the exact opposite, and the crowd is just cheering for everything he says, and especially when he said that Roman should be removed from the triple threat at Battleground. The crowd loved that, and then... Dean Ambrose hops on the mic and just basically disagrees with everything Seth says. And then he just kind of tosses the title at him and then spears him. Um, let's talk about something real quick. Okay. Have you heard, cause I, I read it. I even tweeted about, it. I don't know if you saw my tweet. This was a, like a few days ago. I face Palm so hard. Have you heard the rumors that Vince and, and a promo like this by Seth certainly seems to affirm, uh, those suspicions, but uh, apparently Vince wants to do a redemption kind of storyline with Roman Reigns because of his suspension. Have you been hearing that? I'm not surprised, but I don't think that that's actually going to happen. See, and to me, I forget what the initial source was because I read it on No DQ, of course, that's my go-to place. But they attributed it to some guy who I, I've seen his name before, so I think he's more prominent than some schmuck. You know what I mean? It's just not coming to me right now. But after a promo like this by Seth and Stephanie calling Roman an outright embarrassment... Dude, I'm thinking the signs are kind of there, man. I would not be surprised if this was all to, oh, can Roman redeem himself kind of thing. And I just can't wait for the egg to be all over their face again. I mean, there's stubbornness, and then there's this. What do you even call this, dude? Because I, I honestly don't even know at this point. I have no clue what you call this, John. I I don't even know what to think about calling it i just i just don't know it's weird the, the the best thing i could call it the best two terms uh, well the best term i i could use to articulate it really is willful ignorance like that's the best i can come up with i don't even know if that does this justice because if stephanie calling roman like a, an outright embarrassment if seth just harping on like oh he doesn't deserve anything and this and that if it's all leading to roman coming back and then you get the serious announcer voice can Roman redeem himself and get back to the WWE World Heavyweight Championship? I I will take a spork and I will gag myself simply to finish the job that they started because you have got to be freaking kidding me. That is such bullshit. 
Um, meanwhile, what's not bullshit is what Dean did here. I love the kind of babyface he is. I'm enjoying the kind of babyface champion he's presenting himself as because Seth is really working himself up. You know, he's like he's like one of those guys that I don't know just just feels entitled or stresses out about everything that isn't going his way because it should be going his way, and he's all worked up. And then he sees Dean getting on the opposite of the table, which admittedly creates a pretty cool atmosphere. I like this, and he's like, "Hey, you're the lunatic here. Understand me?" Almost as if uh, Dean imitating him was like saying, "No, Seth, you're the crazy one." So Seth feeling very defensive and he's like, do you understand me? And then Dean's just like, eh, nah, I mean, just take it right now. And he tosses Seth the championship and he starts beating him up. I love how nonchalant and just the lack of fucks that this guy gives. I, I'm, I'm just really enjoying myself, dude. Yeah. I, I got to admit, I really, <sighs> it's weird because that's, almost similar to his character what he was in fcw but it feel and of course it does because it's the freaking wwe but it feels so much more processed and forced now right because like back then it wasn't so much oh i don't care about anything whatever man i'm champion you don't have to care i don't care why do you care i don't care what are you talking about i don't care but in fcw it was nothing is going to break me because i don't care it was they right. were like it was it was just the slight slight tweak that made it better before than it is now. And it's like, now it's just like, Oh, whatever, man, basically stoned Dean Ambrose. Whereas in FCW, it was more like, you know, codeine Dean Ambrose or something. You know what I mean? See, it's interesting because I think what you're trying to articulate, not to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like an FCW, the, I don't care because I, I won't be broken by anything just seemed like a general disposition towards life. Whereas what we're getting in WWE is the end result of a guy achieving his lifelong dream. And now he feels like he could stretch his arms and legs out on his laurels and just be like, Oh, nothing can bother me anymore because I have this, like I've done everything. So I've achieved this peace of mind, which is kind of a different thing. thing. He had that same attitude even before he won the title. Yeah, because going into Money in the Bank, he seemed more lax, too. I don't know about, like, before yeah. that, because he seemed more serious in the feud with Jericho, because Mitch, obviously. But, um... Oh, yeah, you know. because that's serious. Exactly. Uh, at least in WWE's mind, apparently. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you have Money in the Bank, he's like, oh, I'm just gonna fall off some ladders, I'm gonna climb some ladders, I'm gonna fall off some ladders, I'm gonna climb some ladders. And then tonight, which, again, I'm liking. I don't want to backtrack on that. Like, I've been enjoying the stuff. But I can see what you mean. I still, after all this time, and Dean Ambrose has been in the WWE for a, quite a number of years now, and I still don't feel like we've seen the best that he can do. Oh, my God, and, no. Not in main roster WWE, we haven't. No, no. And that that's a terrifying thought because I do feel like, even, you know, even with all this, Dean has had some legitimate gems, no doubt about it. This but, might come off as salty, but everything about Dean Ambrose now is worse than everything about Dean Ambrose when he was in FCW. See, and I, I know you've kind of had that attitude because you and I have talked like I even you and I had a conversation either yesterday or two days ago or, you know, sometime last week. And I said, you know, D- Dean, is he even in your top five anymore? Like, what's going on with you and Dean? Because, I mean, you even have on your Eon Tributes channel, like, that whole uh, Dean Ambrose FCW promo compilation. I know how excited you were about Dean. Well, if you if you just go back and watch that, he had so much more fire back then. I, I mean, do you think it's, it's more on Dean? Like, has he become complacent? Or do you think it's just on WWE, like, creatively shackling him? I, I think – I don't I, – I honestly – well, obviously I don't know. But if I had to guess – I think it's more of a shackling thing. Because I could have sworn, and and maybe somebody in the comments can vouch for me on this. I would really appreciate it. But I, I could have sworn that Dean even like had an appearance on Talk Is Jericho, where he said more or less like I haven't like I don't know how long ago this was. It, it was a while back, I can tell you that. But he said like I haven't even liked a single promo I've done in WWE, or I haven't really even liked anything that I've personally done. Like, I think Dean it comes from a line of guys that's very self-critical, if I had to guess, and he just really didn't seem thrilled with what he was doing. And, obviously, I do think he works as a babyface. This isn't going to be a type of commentary, at least for me, that says, oh, we have to, you know, we have to turn him heel, because, I mean, I'm still waiting on Roman to do it. But, uh, yeah, I don't think we've seen Dean's best, and not even close, and I would really be curious to find out what exactly that looks like. And I think once audience is solid, they they would want more of it. So, yeah, even more so than right now, which I, they, they're pretty hot on him now. Exactly. Like if if we 
saw the Dean Ambrose that you showed me through those FCW clips and everything, I, you know, I don't want to go into, oh, he could be the whole, you know, the next Stone Cold kind of thing, but he could be huge. I mean, and he's already pretty big now, but I think if you really let him just come unglued, like, he'll be the type of guy that, if nothing else, he's the compelling part of programming consistently every week. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, I, it's funny because I feel like he, like, back when he was doing his FCW stuff, I did think that he could have been the next Stone Cold character. Right, right. And now, like, that feels so far in the past. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, where he's found himself isn't terrible. I mean, for God's sakes, you know, he is the world champion. Right. Absolutely. But, and I, like, I'm, yeah. I'm not trying to hate on him as champion. I oh, no, sir. Way, way better champion than Roman. But if I would tell him the truth, I kind of wish Seth would have kept it. And, you know, as a bigger Seth. Then again, I yet. also wish Seth would be heel. So none of us are getting our way, right? Yeah, no, nobody, nobody's getting their way. And, yeah, I'll make that perfectly clear. It's not that you're being critical of Dean as uh, world champion. It's just if you and I are being honest, because we've had many. I even remember, you know, early TwitWow, which, you know, could resurface if you guys all donated to the Patreon. There's the one shout out for the video there. Uh, but we, you know, we talked about what Dean could do. I even remember going on this big thing about how Dean is so intimidating psychologically. Like he'd be the guy you meet in the back alley and you're holding a gun to him and he smiles and you're starting to sweat and you realize you never even controlled the gun this entire time because Dean's just that freaking crazy and not like lunatic fringe crazy no i mean i will bite your ear off kind of crazy and yeah i just don't really feel like we're getting that here now we really are getting to your point like stone dean ambrose which is fine but you know and, and then i wonder like well how committed is WWE to it because you know i've had apprehensions like is roman going to come back and win the title no later than SummerSlam? now if this is going to be a redemption storyline for roman kind of have my doubts because you think you'd want that to last a little while but I'm just wondering how much faith WWE has in Dean Ambrose as champion, and I guess we're going to find that out soon enough. Yep. Okay, so now I think we should move on. Yeah. But not to what happened next on Raw, because there's big news that came out on Reddit that I need to share. Oh, okay. Brock Lesnar's SummerSlam opponent. Oh, so we know who it is, or... Well, if by we you mean WWE has released a statement telling people what it is, then no. Right. But if you mean we, as in people that frequent the Squared Circle subreddit, yes. Who is it? Randy Orton! Yes! It's finally happening, dude! <laughs> yeah, there we go. That, would, that was going to be my objective pick. I was sticking to Orton. I'm like, SummerSlam. I, I saw Orton's name on a live event coming up in August. I'm like, it all seems to be coming together, and we're finally getting that fucking match. And I swear if I don't get an F5 into an RKO counter, I will hurt someone. <laughs> That's great, though. Oh, I've been holding that in for probably 20 minutes now. I just wanted to find a logical breaking point to stop talking about the show and talk about that. Dude, that match, I hope that match lives up and even exceeds our expectations. Because I know you and I personally have wanted that match for so fucking long. This oh, it feels so good to be able to finally get it off my chest and finally be able to say that we're getting that match. Dude, I can't wait. See, now I'm already hyped for SummerSlam for that one match alone. Don't ruin the momentum, WWE. Well, I mean, that and Charlotte Sasha. Exactly. Yeah, SummerSlam might actually be a great show. I don't know. I mean, we'll see. Tell anyone but Joe Sheamus. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even know that that was uh, there were rumblings about that being a thing. Yeah, most people don't. Not even Reddit knows that one. Where did you get that one? The Angry Mark. Ah, see, there you go, Gordon. Like I told you, you're gonna have to really get on that, my friend. But uh, yeah, I mean, not very interesting car. And you know the funny thing, and I'm I'm gonna be the first one to say it. I think Joe and Sheamus could have a good match. I, I think because Sheamus, he's really good when he is able to really, like, brawl and get physical with somebody. And Joe, I mean, he, he defines oh, yeah. physicality. So I actually yeah. think those two could have a good bout. I, I really do. Uh, quick question for you, though, about that, okay. if you don't mind. Because yeah. I, I read uh, a rumor. Now, again, this could have just been doing it for the sake of doing it because it was a live event. But I heard recently that... Uh, Seamus is working babyface at a live event recently. Is he the babyface in that program? Or do you think Joe being the newer guy, like he's going to be the babyface and Seamus just like Apollo Crews is going to be salty that people are coming in on his territory? I don't know. I kind of hope Seamus plays face just because I don't even care about Seamus, whether he's face or heel. And I prefer Joe as a heel. So by default, I would rather Seamus be face 
And you know what? I completely agree. I mean, look, if his work on NXT has been any in- indication, Joe as a heel would own that main roster, man. <laughs> so freaking good like i'll be honest with you joe's the type of heel where i wouldn't even want us to like you know piss around and like waste all this time like get him in a ring with dean ambrose for that world title as soon as possible because that's a series of matches i i'm just licking my chops to see so yeah did not know about that match but i'm very glad you enlightened us all to it i'm so excited now (laughs) yeah definitely SummerSlam really is on paper shaping up to be a great show SummerSlam always feels like it's more actually meant to be for wrestling fans than WrestleMania. Yeah, I know, right? It's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Well, All right. Last year, I forget, wasn't there like a bunch of crazy matches last year that they build SummerSlam as bigger than WrestleMania? That's right, Taker Lesnar was last year. Yeah, that's right. Oh, God. <laughs> that abortion of a match. <laughs> We're finally getting Lesnar Orton, though, so it was worth it. We uh, won out. All uh, right. So now we can, I guess we can move on to what happened next. We had a Wyatt family video and they invited the new day to their compound. Yeah. Really liking where they're taking the storyline. I mean, Ashton, what did you think of all this? I mean, the Wyatt family is one of those things where they're only really as good as their portrayed credibility wise and they've been portrayed really well credibility wise in this feud so i'm looking forward to what this happens what happens with this i agree with everything you said in fact i'm not even gonna add anything to that we can move on baron corbin had a vignette you know what's better than a vignette showing up on the fucking show (laughs) like let me just and you know what if i did have a baron corbin be a part of the 16 man tag instead of Zack Ryder and get that rub yeah, and you know what? First of all, you're absolutely correct. Second of all, and I know that this is probably me being salty, so forgive me, everybody, because I understand how they set it up. Oh, Dolph requested the match. But why is Dolph, who came out of a losing effort against Baron Corbin, now facing people the caliber of Seth Rollins, which, by the way, in hindsight, really does make, doesn't make Rollins look all that great having Ziggler take him to the limit like he did, because, again, Ziggler lost to Baron Corbin, who's supposed to be a newer guy, and newer by association means lower on the totem pole. So, like, how does any of this work? I, if anything, and see, this is another reason why Seth should be babyface, because then you could have done Corbin being like, oh, the way I took care of Ziggler isn't even going to compare to how I'm going to destroy you, and we could have had that really intriguing match. But no... No, we have to keep Seth heel because Roman Reigns is going to redeem himself. You don't like that storyline? It's irrelevant. <sighs> I hate everyone so much. <laughs> but yeah, dude, like... Dude, this I, I, is the Corbin effect. This happened to him in NXT all the time where he would beat people and then they would move on to do better and better things and he never really got a proper push. It's not fair, damn it. It's about him. It's about him. God, I really hope this draft, I'm telling you, the two people I'm really rooting for in this draft, there are others, don't get me wrong, I don't want to make it seem like, you know, there are no others. Can two I people, I'm, Yeah. Corbin, obviously. Yes. And Neville? Rusev. Uh, Neville ooh, and Rusev. wow. Yeah. Yeah, is Rusev going to be, like, the number three overall pick when we do our draft? I'm not giving away anything I'm planning, mainly because I haven't done my fantasy draft yet. But <laughs> I'll see it when it's unveiled. But I, I, I will say this. I will say this. Don't be surprised if Rusev's in my top ten because I think the world of him. I really do. I can't honestly. I can't wait for him to drop that U.S. championship only if he's on SmackDown because I want to look at it as it's a pair of cement shoes. And as far as Baron Corbin, he doesn't need a championship to wear cement shoes because he's getting freaking vignettes instead of TV time. And I know the shining stars are too. And believe me, that too is an injustice. Okay, it's all an injustice. It's an injustice. It's an injustice, Don. <laughs> worst, worst booking ever. Get him in the damn ring, or else I'm gonna hurt someone. I will not stand for this. Okay, okay, look. Wash out the retainer, and then we can move on, all right? But yeah, Baron Corbin, fucking vignettes. And then we had Vicky Guerrero. Which I liked. I mean, did oh. you like it? or you Well, just you like, liked eh. it, so you need to talk about it. Well, I mean, you know, look. Here, here's why I say I like it, because it's like Jackie said on Twitter. At least we got what we wanted. We were like, look, if you're going to bring back past GMs, don't like... Harp on Kane, like they did those two weeks in a row, like really commit to it. Teddy, John Laurinaitis, and yeah, Vicky was on that list. So her showing up seemed obligatory to me, 
And honestly, she's one of the better personalities. I mean, she, when she was around, got legitimate nuclear heat just from excuse me alone. So I'll take her over John Laurinaitis any day of the week. And, uh, yeah, just like, you know, says excuse me a few times. What's the and matter, I, John? You don't like people power? Oh, my God. Please take care of your fucking stoma. But anyway, Vicky Guerrero is is just like, excuse me a few times. And then... I lo- Isn't the stoma the throat hole that people get with throat cancer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, like he- what what Kane had kayfabe wise when he first debuted, and he had to talk with a speaker box. Exactly. <sighs> oh my god, those were the days. Sake. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. god. God, uh, I love how Vicky though. As soon as she's like telling people, "Excuse me," and being all obnoxious, then she tries to like curry their favor, and is like, "Oh come on, guys! Vicky Guerrero for SmackDown can trend. We can trend it." And then security comes up, and this is my favorite part. He's like, "Excuse me, I wasn't done." And she actually hits one of them in the face. <laughs> And then they carry her off. I really thought they were going to put her in cuffs, though, because she legit, like, punched one of them in the face. So I thought cops were going to come out. So they're like, no! I do, like, all that Vicky Garo <laughs> screaming where it's so shrill and high, and I just want to die in that moment because living is too much of an agony to bear. But no, she goes she goes rather peaceably. And, uh, you know, I know we don't, we don't get the Dolph-Vicky interaction immediately after this. So uh, unless there's anything else you want to say about it, you can uh, move us on to the next segment. Well, I mean, the only thing that happened between those two segments was the big show pep talk to Team USA. Oh, please. Can we skip it? Please. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about Vicky and Dolph. Thank fuck. I I, I owe you one for that. That was a judgment call and you made the right choice. I will remember that. You know what? And you should, because that that promo was ass. I even tweeted, the patriotism is so strong. Please, somebody kill me. Oh, my God. So then you get Dolph Ziggler and Vicky Guerrero. Dolph's on the phone, which actually I'm laughing more at Dolph than at Vicky, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, And then Vicky's like, Dolph, Dolph, look, tell him. Tell him we know each other. Tell him you know me. We have a history. And he's like, guys, guys, I've never seen this one before in my life. No, Dolph! And she just gets carried off. But what really makes me laugh, because as you all know, Johnny Scumbag laughs at the failures of others. Dolph is on the phone with somebody we don't know. And he's like, yeah, yeah, it was close. I tried really hard. Wow, Dolph. You are so into yourself. You will pretty much sell how you failed. But I was really close, though. I was really close. You're pathetic, sir. You're pathetic. And honestly, along with Zack Ryder, you should quit trying. Except the only difference is Zack Ryder actually won tonight. What the fuck is going on, Dolph? Get your shit together. So with that in mind, Ash, is there anything you want to say about it? No. All right, let's move on. Okay, so then we got the Vaudevillains versus Golden Truth, and I'm shocked that this wasn't a heat of the night for you. Yeah, you know what? It wasn't a heat of the night, again, Ashton, because, like, what's there to be offended about when I'm, like, totally anticipating it? Like, yeah, I like the Vaudevillains, and here's the thing, because I mentioned on TitWow that I feel like the Vaudevillains got buried. Now, let me explain myself, because I know, and I admit, that term gets thrown around a lot, but here I think it actually works, because when you think about it, Vaudevillains come up, Their first match is actually in the Tag Team number 1 Contendership Tournament sponsored by the New Day. They win. In fact, they win the tournament. And then no, they, they didn't win the tournament. Oh, no, they, well, they, they, they won de facto, though, because Enzo got his injury, unfortunately. So then the Vaudevillains... So they won by default. They won by default, but a win's a win. We've said it before. I'll say it now. You know, sorry for Enzo, but it happened. They get a shot at the titles. Don't win them. That's fine. They get another shot in that big fatal four-way match. Don't win that. They're out of the title picture. But then that's where it really starts to become a slippery slope because they lose to Enzo and Cass. And now this most recent loss, Enzo and Cass are a pretty high team, especially given what they're going to be doing, which we found out you know, later, which we'll get to. So they're in a really good place. So Vaudevillains losing to them, that makes sense. But then the Vaudevillains lose to Golden Truth. It's like the quality of teams that they're losing to from champions to guys that really could be champions to guys that are a comedy act. Yeah, to me, it's a freaking burial. Like, that, there is no credibility to the Vaudevillains now. And uh, I forget who said it to me. I, I think it was Peeps, I want to say 48 or 84 Peep on show? Twitter. Pe- I think it was Peep Show, but there's always a number by it, I think. I can't remember. But yeah, Peep Show was, said. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'm looking on my Twitter right now. And 
Let's see here. It was because they were tweeting me as well. There it is. Uh, Peep. Oh, it wasn't Peep Show. It was Peep the Peep. It was just the Peep, and the the username is Peep for Life eighty three. Okay, okay, that's that's what I was trying to think of. Thank you. And he's like, you know, I hope you weren't surprised, unfortunately, because this was nothing but a full sale act. And he's right. You know, we from the very beginning said we didn't know how this is going to work out, and now we've seen how it's worked out like the quality of opponents that they're losing to is just getting worse which just makes them look worse right so yeah bald villains are in a really shitty place right now obviously i'm not happy about it but what can you expect you know they're not an act that's gonna main event or be in those main caliber feuds again like enzo and Cass, who i'm extremely happy for well but to lose to golden truth yeah that bleach is looking pretty attractive right about now jesus the temporary solution to a or a, wow, I really botched that. A permanent solution to a temporary problem. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of permanent solutions to temporary problems, we've got breaking news. Okay. Later. Oh, fair enough. People have to stay tuned. There you go. Okay, so then we had a Make Darren Young Great Again vignette. Uh, any thoughts? Backland signed over the Crossface Chicken Wing, even though he already signed it over to Skrull. That's right. Uh, I I want to see Darren use it. I want to see Darren, period, but mostly I want to see him use the crossface chicken wing to win a match. That will be very cool imagery, and I look forward to it as well, though. Let's not get it twisted. Marty Skrull has been and forever will be the king of the wing. So there you go. Does he actually refer to himself as that? It's on a t-shirt of his. That is I amazing. Know, I know because I peruse the entire selection of Marty Skrull t-shirts, and I do plan on purchasing one in the near future, hopefully in the next few months. So I there you go. decision on which one? I think I did. Yeah, and it's pretty beast. So ah, Well, I mean, hey, while we're talking about Marty Skrull, and then since tonight is already a heavy news night, ladies and gentlemen, tune in tomorrow when John and I post our live reactions to PWG Prince. Yeah, it's going to be a really fun show, guys. And speaking of Marty Skrull, I know that he's going to be taking on Mark Andrews. Ooh. So that's going to be a really Couple fun of match. Brits, mitt. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope Marty Skrull gets the win because it seems like all he does in PWG is lose. I can't even remember the last time he won a match there, but uh, that's okay because I've just been watching some stellar Marty Skrull matches. And uh, I mean, for yeah, what it's worth, fix. though, the people that he loses to are kind of big deals. Yeah, I mean, certainly. I mean, even I mean, look. Even with uh, the last PWG show we watched where he lost to uh, Chuck Taylor, it really seems to me like they're trying to make Chuck Taylor a big deal, which, hey, I'm cool with because I love me some Chucky e. T. So, you know, Wait, it all works out. Wasn't that – wasn't that – no, that, was, that wasn't the last one we watched because wasn't that at uh, – Yeah, it was. It was at Bowie. No, no. Uh, Marty Skrull versus Ch- uh, Chuck e. T. That was All-Star Weekend Night 2, which we, you and I just got done watching. Oh, yeah, you're right. That was my bad. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, good stuff. But yeah, uh, Prince is the one that we're doing live right to. That should be a fun show. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, buddy. All right. So uh, moving on, what else happened? John Cena. All right. I'm going to give you the entire floor for this. I feel like I've been talking about a lot of the segments. What did you think of all of this? I thought this was great. Uh, Cena opened up talking about AJ Styles and his style wink (laughs) right (laughs) and you know just kind of the decisions that aj's made and stuff and talked about how some people have been waiting 15 years to see this and that kind of stuff and eventually aj and the club do come out and aj you know he talks to cena and he brings up the shovel thing again with the burying and points out that and i like this that nobody ever comes out to help john cena yeah. I thought that was really clever and, and kind of a really good trope to use because, I mean, it's true. No one ever really does come out to help him. Yeah, he's always left, you know, by himself. And AJ says, I mean, do you want to know why that is? Because nobody can relate to you, John. Like, I'm pretty much saying, like, you're on such a such a level that yes. I think guys would want to be there and they just really don't yeah. care what happens to you. He said that he, he's put himself on an island that no one else can touch. Exactly. And exactly. I love, too, that he said that the more people can relate to us. And I think a lot of people want to be where we are because a lot of people would love to beat up John Cena. Yes. And we're and the would... only ones with balls big enough to actually get it done. Exactly. And then 
from this whole sentiment of wanting to beat up John Cena, what proceeds from that is just a great gag among the club, dude. Oh, oh, we're coming up here. We've got the 4th of July. Well, up next, next thing you know, it's going to be Labor Day. What are you going to do on Labor Day, Carl? And then Carl Anderson says, uh, I'm going to beat up John Cena. <laughs> and then, well, what comes after Labor Day? Is it, is it Halloween? And then <laughs> Luke Gallows, what did he say he was going to dress up as? Bushwhacker Luke Ski, I think. <laughs> Bushwhacker Luke ski and he's gonna lick aj's face and then he's gonna beat up john cena <laughs> and then he brings up you know all these different holidays and he eventually gets to christmas and he asks carl what he's gonna do for christmas and he says i'm gonna wrap up presents for my little kid with my hot asian wife and then i'm gonna beat up john cena <laughs> this whole thing by the club first of all aj's best promo to date i think yeah, with I, even, yeah and... I was even saying during this that aj is kind of starting to really come into his own as a heel talker on the mic yes and i gotta say too not to take credit away from aj as quickly as i gave it but i almost feel like personally carl anderson stole the show here because i just love how he answered the questions he had two lines and he stole the show yeah like you said I mean, because with the Labor Day thing, before he even says beat up John Cena, he's like, oh, AJ, thank you for asking. Like, what? Like, I love, like, how polite and, like, conversational he is. And then when it's about Christmas, oh, oh, you know, AJ, I'm going to wrap presents for my kids with my hot Asian wife. I love how he says it with a tone to, like, fuck you guys, because I have it made. And then I'm just sitting here with a stupid smile on my face, like, you know, Carl Anderson's right. I should go fuck myself, because I don't have a hot Asian wife. Like... <laughs> He's so good. And I'll be honest, Luke Gallows, I don't get the whole ski kind of running gag that he adds certain words. I really don't get it. But yeah, he's comical, too. I enjoy it. And you're right. AJ's coming into his own as a heel talker. Mick Foley even tweeted like he feels like AJ's becoming more comfortable, which I agree. I think when you're among friends, you probably do feel more comfortable. And, yeah, they're just, like, so fixated on beating up John Cena. Like, I'm like, hey, oh, I want to beat up John Cena. I actually like him right now. You know, they really got me in the mood. So great stuff. Wow, you like him, so you want to beat him up. Dude, I'm a scumbag. What else do you expect? <laughs> like, I know you, and think about all the horrible things I've said to you. I don't know John Cena. <laughs> oh, man. All right. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I just love Carl Anderson and his, like, and even, like, I think it was two weeks ago where it was, I'm sorry, man. Like, John, I I'm a, I apologize. I didn't really mean to beat the shit out of you at the pay-per-view. It was just, you know, it's instinct, man. I can't help it. Exactly. So good. <laughs> He's awesome. The casual tone to his voice is amazing. It wins. It wins. And That's no one else is really good. doing that right now other than Dean, and Dean's the man. So if you're going to aspire to anyone, right? Exactly. There you go. <laughs> So then we had them come down to the ring and beat the hell out of Cena. Uh, of course, because he is John Cena, he handled one of the three of them by himself fairly well. But then the gang up got to him. But as they're beating up Cena, next thing you know, very familiar music hits from earlier on in the night. Enzo and Cass. And they come out and they actually helped and tried to defend John Cena, which is a rare thing. This is amazing. I and it's really smart thought on the WWE's behalf. Definitely. Look, they're capitalizing on the momentum that Enzo and Cass have. And look, I'm just going to be straightforward. I think that's not the only reason this happened. Because, I mean, believe me, if WWE always listened to crowd response, I think we'd have a very different landscape than what we do. Uh, I think it's also because I think WWE sees a huge future in Cass as a single star. And they probably want to have him rub shoulders with John Cena like this. And, you know, I mean, good, good for them, you know, that they get to have this. And, yeah, it should be a very interesting match because we know at Battleground now, because of this segment, it's going to be the club, AJ Styles, Carl Anderson, and Luke Gallows versus John Cena and Enzo and Cass. I mean, what a terrific spot to be in on the Battleground pay-per-view. Yeah, buddy. I mean, yeah, let's be real. This is huge. This is... Enzo and Cass are basically stars already, but if they weren't, they would be more stars now than they were then. Exactly. And honestly, this couldn't come at a better time because I do feel like because 
of the quality of work that Cena's been producing as of late. And, you know, like you even said uh, aloud, you know, when we're watching Raw together, Cena, you know, being away prior to all this because of an injury, you know, he doesn't have that vitriolic kind of response that we're used to seeing him get. So if there's any time to put Enzo and Cass in proximity with Cena, this does seem to be the time. So, yeah, everything I think is working out as it should. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. All right. So uh, I think we can move on, right? Absolutely. All right. Summer Rae versus Becky Lynch. What'd you think? I I mean, it was too quick for me to be super passionate about it, but it was fun while it lasted. Yeah, I mean, I certainly had fun with it. I wish they'd do more with Summer because then who knows? I mean, you know, Brand Split may be able to help anybody. Maybe Summer would be on that list. I doubt it, but you never know. And, yeah, she did what she could with the time they were given, but ultimately she fell to the disarmor, and Becky got the tap out. Of course, as you noted, at the start of the show, Natalia was watching uh, from a monitor, so we didn't even really get any physical involvement between these two, but we know that these two are going to have a match against each other at Battleground. And now I really hope we do get some kind of a women's title match, because then this really would be an event where we had two distinct feuds you know, involving women both getting featured on a pay-per-view. I, I really hope that happens. Yeah. And that, yeah. I mean, I was hoping that that would happen at Payback with Sasha Summer, uh, Becky, I forget who she was feuding with, Becky Emma. Right. And then, yeah, and then Charlotte Natalia. Which I, I will say again, so it just stays fresh in everybody's minds, I do miss Emma. So, you know, as soon as she comes back, the better for the women's division. So Yeah, I don't think that there's anyone who's out right now that I miss more than her. Even, like, Neville. Like, I love Neville, but if I could choose to have anyone back right now, it would be Emma over him right now. Yeah, she's so good, dude. She oh, is. my God. Yeah, and maybe, I don't know, maybe Dana would turn on charlotte if emma was back i doubt it but you never know maybe honestly dude what kind of scares me is because emma even tweeted when she saw dana with charlotte like pretty much what's this like i made you what the hell are you doing i wonder if emma may even return as a baby face. i mean still with the attitude right she's not going to go back to popping bubbles but i wonder if she's going to return as a baby face and just like get a pound of dana's flesh for turning on her so quick when she was injured so I really don't want her to come back as a face. We have too many faces in the women's division as it is. I mean, I agree with you. I, I think Emma has just that top heel potential, especially in the women's division with her gimmick. She it's... needs to be Sasha's first challenger. Yes. Oh, God, those matches, those matches. Though. I know. The, yeah. Like two of the top three workers in the company. Exactly. Oh my God. Yeah, folks, there's a lot that needs to happen. I mean, we got Brock Orton finally, so I'm not going to be too greedy, but goddamn, like, let's pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah, and and there might be a reason that WWE's been doing all these crazy dream matches recently and going forward. Oh, is that is that hinting back again at that breaking news that you said we were going to hear? Yeah, bit? yeah, I think I'm going to break that when we're done with our Raw review, but before we do high spots and low shots. Sounds good to me. So up next, we had Sonic ad with Enzo and Cass. Kind of weird. Um, you know, I, I still to this day, my favorite in-programming WWE ad for another company is Natalia and Tyson Kidd's chicken fries ad. That was so good. Just because Tyson Kidd got to neglect Natalia, and who wouldn't want to do that? Especially for chicken fries, which look yeah. delicious. Well, um, yeah, Burger King's chicken tastes kind of fishy, so I'm not a fan of it, but yeah. There you go. Uh, so what came after the Sonic ad? The New Day promo. All right. What did you think of this, man? Because I feel like Xavier really brought it tonight. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, John, I, I was barely paying attention to Kofi and Big E. So if you could kind of fill in the context, what were they saying before the Wyatt scare happened? Um, here's the thing, dude, like I couldn't give you any quotes per se, but I, I think the general theme of their half of the promo was, oh, the Wyatts are, you know, backwoods hillbillies. They, I think they made a reference, like, an allusion to incest. Because they're like, they keep it within the family, you know what I mean? That was one thing they said. So, yeah, it was like a lot of, like, oh, they're from this part of the world. And then they just invoked all the cliches that you can imagine from being where the Wyatts are from. Right. So, yeah. And then we get the Wyatt family show up. And, John, I, again, wasn't paying much attention what did the Wyatt family actually say here because I know I paid attention to the first thing where they said 
that the New Day was invited to their compound. But what did they say here? I mean, again, just to give a generalized account like I did for Biggie and Kofi, it's just that, you know, they live in the real world. Like where the, where they come from is the real world and there is pain in their world. And, and you know, optimism and positivity, you know, it's an illusion. It's not going to work. You know, you couldn't even bring it here. You guys aren't living in reality. And then they, they challenge them. Like if you're so confident in your power positivity, you know, come to the compound, see what you got. And, you know, again, Biggie and Kofi continue to make a joke of it. But then I'm going to field this to you, Ashton, because I know you were at full attention for this. Xavier finally pipes up. So what do you think? I love this from Xavier. He was just – and it's funny because for the last couple of you know appearances where we've had him acting funny around the Wyatt family, I thought that they were going to do an angle of him joining the Wyatt family. Right. But now – it just kind of feels like they're using him and his fear to put over how legitimate the Wyatts are. Right. So I'm going to ask you a question. Now, okay. if you don't want to answer because you feel like it could potentially be spoiling uh, when we do Battleground Proven Predictions, I will respect that. But do you think Xavier's pep talk, like, is that going to make Kofi and Big E become serious? And maybe that's how they triumph over the Wyatt family? Or do you think the Wyatt family, like, I don't know, maybe they'll get to Xavier even more? How do you see this unfolding? Because now, I, don't, I mean... Well, dude, I don't even think that we're necessarily going to get a tag team championship match between these two teams. Oh, you think maybe even, like, a six-man? I, I like, mean, that's, that's possible. And if they do a six-man, I definitely think the Wyatt family would win that because of the fact that the titles wouldn't be on the line then. Right, right. I agree. Yeah, but like, I don't know, man. I feel like... There's a really weird vibe coming through this, and I'm not even sure if I like it or not, but it's really interesting, and I, I don't know how to feel about it. I mean, the one word I would use, because, I mean, I would say if I had to choose between am I having more negative feelings or positive feelings, they, they do lean more towards the positive spectrum, but the one word that I would use, regardless of my feelings, is engrossed. Like, I am engrossed to see how this plays out, because, yeah, yeah just how they're handling the storyline, and Xavier is really looking like the MVP. And I love Bray to death, but Xavier between his facial expressions and finally speaking up, and I felt like what he had to say, the words weren't wasted. Right. You know, because he put over the Y family big time, but he also, you know, he more or less says, like, guys, I'm only telling you this because I look at the two of you like family. So it comes from a place of deep concern, deep love, but most of all, deep fear. And he communicates that fear so well here. Uh, yeah, Xavier MVP. I, I think he's done really well in this angle. Yeah, man. I mean, the thing is, Xavier is doing a better job of making the Wyatt family seem credible than the WWE's writing has done it ever. Exactly. I think the last time the Wyatt family felt this legit was the children's choir. And even then, Bray had to rely on Luke and Eric and a child to actually beat Cena in that cage match. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, even when they feel scary, they don't necessarily feel credible, but now they feel credible. So based on this promo, now obviously things can change week to week, quite literally, if we take script rewrites to mean anything. Um, do you think that a defection to the family is still possible for Xavier? Or is this going to be more of a story of no. guy, guy succumbs to his fear lose everything, but then he overcomes his fear later on and just kind of redeems himself. Like what kind of story do you think they're telling with Xavier? Um, they might be using this as an angle to break up the new day because of the draft and they're probably going to get drafted to different shows, but I don't necessarily think that it's going to be, you know, Xavier joining the Wyatt family. Well then, uh, one last question for you. And I know I'm coming at you with a barrage of questions, but you mentioned the draft. Now, you and I agree that Xavier did quality work here tonight, and I know you and I also agree that overall, Xavier is a quality performer. What scares me about the draft is I worry a guy like Xavier, despite all of his upside, could get lost in the shuffle. Like, so do you think this angle could be like a launching pad to get him in a stable spot in a post WWE well, draft? I hope so, but there's never a guarantee, and especially because things are going to be really shaken up later this year. Right, right. I I don't know, man. See, what would be interesting, right, is if this angle continued, like, post-WB uh, draft and say, like, because he even said, like, Big E, Kofi, you guys are like my family. Well, if you're separated from your family, I don't know, Xavier, we could really portray him in my mind 
as very lonely, very isolated, and Bray preys on those kinds of feelings. Like, yeah. those are the kinds of feelings he thrives on exploiting. And he's like, Xavier, I know you're feeling lost without your family, but we could be your family now, or something like that, you know what I mean? And then Xavier trades in one stable for another, and that's how we get him to the Wyatt family because he feels so alone. And maybe even uh, Kofi and Biggie would hear about it and they'd be like, we don't care what brand we're on. Like you're our family and we want to get you back from the clutches of the family. And then it really becomes for the conscience of Xavier Woods, if you will. I think that could be interesting. Yeah, Just man. That is definitely interesting. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't, it's funny because last week I was pushing hard for Xavier to join the family, but after tonight, I genuinely don't think he will. Yeah. I'm, See, and here's my thing, right? I agree with you, but then, like, my thought is, is this going to be a story of, like, oh, Xavier was so afraid, but when it mattered most, he overcame his fears. And if it is, how do I feel about that? Because I, I honestly be don't that, know. Though. I don't think that's going to be what it is. You don't think that's going to be what it is? Nah. Hmm. I, I hope you're right. But again, you know, like we always say, it's WWE. So you, you can never really take anything off the table, I don't think. So I hope you're right. But <laughs> You know what you can take off the table with WWE? Quality. Logic. I think they go hand in hand. You, when you have one, you make the other. So yeah, I, I think both of our answers work. <laughs> They're not mutually inclusive, but they definitely do have some similarities. Exactly. Okay, are we ready to move on? Absolutely. Main event. Seven, seven, seventh match of the night. Sixteen man elimination tag match. I already listed all the people in Titwow, and I'm going to go for. The second shot. Here we go. Cesaro, Kalisto, Sin Cara, Alberto Del Rio, Sheamus, Kevin Owens, Chris Jericho, Sami Zayn, The Big Show, Kane, Mark Henry, Apollo Crews, Jack Swagger, Zack Ryder, and the Dudley Boys. Uh, before we unpack this match, I said at the start of the show when we were talking about the food fight that Kevin Owens was the star of the show tonight for this segment. And then before this match, Team Multinational had a backstage promo together. Oh, yeah, and I, I love to write that down. I loved what Kevin Owens said here because everybody's kind of bickering among themselves. Like, Chris Jericho's like, well, to all of you guys, I, I, you know, I say screw the 4th of July, but happy Canada Day. And Sammy shrugs. Like, I know I give Sammy a hard time, but he was great here, too, because he's like, I'm just kind of here, so, you know, go team, I guess. The people but, that I really get along with here are Cesaro <laughs> and the Lucha Dragons. Yeah, you guys, especially you, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then Bugger Kevin, off, Mitt. So then Kevin, like, hearing all this bickering, he's like, enough! Enough! You know, I got hit with a pie when I really shouldn't have because that stupid food fight. And now... I really want to beat up some stupid Americans. And then the best part is, because then I have to give credit to Chris, Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens. I I know that um, people wanted the tag team of Jericho, uh, you know, because Kevin Owens and Jericho work so well as a tag team. And their chemistry is still on point here, because Jericho's about to say, he says so meekly that that's my land. Kevin Owens like, I don't care. And and Jericho's like, whoa, whoa, easy, easy. You can have it. Uh, Just we're cool. We're cool. I love how he's just like, he knows how serious Kevin is. So he's like, you know, I, I could give everybody the gift to Jericho, but I got super kicked last week and I'm in a good mood. So I'm just going to let him have this one. Like he knows Kevin Owens is cantankerous. So he's just going to let him do it. And then Kevin just like, all right, well, I just need to shape up. I, I loved it, dude. I love how pissy Kevin Owens was. And even for Jericho to follow suit, just left me in stitches. So yeah, that was a great backstage segment. But then going back to the match, we see that, um, you know, team multinational, they, uh, they're doing pretty well at, at first. It seems like, you know, they're, they're, you know, really eliminating people. They suffer some early losses because uh, who, who was the first elimination? Was that team USA or was that team multinational? The first, I actually have these written down. The first elimination was Sin Cara, who was eliminated right. by Bubba Ray Dudley. Right. And then didn't Bubba get eliminated by the team of Seamus and Kalisto. Yeah, how crazy is that? <laughs> Seamus hit him with a brogue kick, and then Kalisto did some flippy shit. Exactly. And then the next elimination after that? Do you just want me to go down the list? Yeah, go down the list, man. All right, Devon Dudley eliminated by Cesaro. Jack right. Swagger eliminated by Chris Jericho. Kalisto eliminated by Mark Henry. Mark Henry eliminated by Kevin Owens, very impressively, I might add. 
Kevin Owens eliminated via disqualification. And then, before I even continue on this list, the dumbest moment of this entire Raw, Kane was disqualified for hitting Kevin Owens, who was already disqualified and not in the match anymore, with a chair. Yeah, when has that ever happened? I don't think it ever has, which is exactly why it makes it the stupidest moment of the show. I mean, holy hell. You're disqualified for hitting some random guy that's not even in this match anymore with a chair. And not only that, you could even argue that Kevin Owens' disqualification was stupid because it initially started. I mean, he also did hit Kane with the chair later, so I guess you made up for it. But initially, like, he hit Sami Zayn, his own partner. And again, when has somebody ever been disqualified simply because they got sick of their own partner? Not any match that I can remember. So, yeah, that part of the match was just crazy, dude. Really seemed to kind of have a breakdown and not in a good way. Yeah, it was really stupid. And probably, I'm going to say the dumbest ref move that I've seen since that one NXT thing with the Ascension. I don't even know the incident you're referring to. That's how shoddy my memory is. I don't remember what it was either, but something stupid happened where a ref was doing something with the Uh, Ascension. Oh, you know what? I remember because you and I made a big stink about it. Oh, yeah. I think the ref disqualified the Ascension for breaking up a pin or something like that. Yeah, something like that. Or was it like staying beyond a five count or something when we didn't even feel like it was five count? It wasn't even a five count. I think they were outside of the ring. Yeah, that's what it was. The, the, The Ascension were outside of the ring and they were beating up a team outside of the ring and they got disqualified. Right. Right. Like, uh, I think it was something like that. I don't know. Basically the Ascension was following the rules and they got disqualified for breaking a rule that has only been, that was only relevant like 40 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. Officials drunk with power, if I've ever seen it. So yeah, that breakdown was stupid. And then I think you had a few more eliminations to list off. So Sammy Zayn was eliminated by Apollo Crews. Cruz was eliminated by Sheamus. Cesaro was eliminated by Zack Ryder. Yeah. Chris Jericho eliminated by the Big Show. Alberto Del Rio eliminated by the Big Show. And then Sheamus finally eliminated by Zack Ryder. So we had a four on two. It was Cesaro, Jericho, Del Rio, and Sheamus. And Zack Ryder and the Big Show handled all four of them because Cesaro basically turned on his own team and made it a three on three in a sense. Which, I mean, I don't blame him because I think that whole uppercut train was, you know, kind of saying, you know, I know that you're going to announce Brock's opponent at SummerSlam and now we know that they passed the buck on Cesaro, but Cesaro's just pretty much like, I'm so much better than this match. And you know something? He's not even wrong. Exactly. (laughs) Absolutely right. And as far as that riding in the win, which honestly, I mean, maybe it's because I haven't checked in a while. I didn't get bombed with notifications like, oh, John, Zack Ryder won. How does that make you feel? And if I do, if I do come home to that when this show's over, uh, I'm just going to let everybody know it really doesn't because this is probably going to be such a poorly viewed Raw. So that's when you give him the push, when the least amount of eyes are on the product. If anything, that's more comical than his failures. So, yeah, I'm still good about it. (gasps) This is going to have a record low rating. (laughs) Guys, I finally won a match, but did you see the rating? No. no. And then then, then he sees the numbers. And then he gets blamed for the rating and he's never on TV again. Oh, how did you know my fan fiction? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, I will say, it's kind of transparent, John. You're not even (laughs) trying at this point. Well, look at that. I finally perfected my raw imitation. But anyway. Oh... (laughs) Zack Ryder and Big Show celebrate to end the show. They got the American flag come down. I wanted Rusev to interrupt and just tear it off. <laughs> Such a dick. But yeah, that's pretty much how the show ends. Do you have any concluding remarks about it? I have no concluding remarks about it. Then I will leave the floor with you because you said before we get to high spots, low shots, what is this breaking news? Vince is selling the company. Ooh, to who? Uh, well, I don't think that that's necessarily been confirmed yet. From what I understand, it is some Danish group or something. Very, and wow, uh, I mean. We're talking later this year selling the company. Not like, you know, five years from now, but like, literally, Vince put an ex- an exploratory and a transitional team together to sell the company. And, the you know, the transition team is already together for the sale. It's pretty much a done deal. And it's going to be going down fourth quarter in the fall. And it sounds like it's some kind of Danish group that's going to be buying them. Uh, Why do you think this sale is happening, dude? Uh, Angry Mark broke the news on on Under the Mat Radio or on uh, Way Too Real Radio earlier today. 
Um, yeah, but I mean, like the motivations of the sale, like, are, is the company? I didn't think the company. I haven't. I haven't been able to listen to the show. I was just talking to uh, the guy that runs Way Too Real on Twitter, and he told me the, you know, the, the soundbite basically. Oh, okay. So we don't know any of Vince's motivations, like his reasoning behind doing this sale. No, that's I mean, what I'm, I'm really sure. Curious. I'm sure we'll end up listening to the podcast where they discuss it later and find more out about it. But just for now, just know that the sale is happening. I mean, look, you and I are no strangers to conjecture, so let's do that a little bit. Like, what do you think that says about the state of the WWE? Like, it, I don't know. I, do you... I think I think Vince is maybe Vince realizes he's out of touch and he wants to put the company in hands that he doesn't necessarily have to worry about. And you know, because if he would put the title, if he would or the title, if he would put the company in the hands of you know Shane or Stephanie and Triple H he would still kind of be connected with it. You know what I mean? Like he would still yeah. have emotional investment. Whereas if he just sells, makes him a billionaire again, it, you know, it brings his personal stock up like crazy, gives him tons of money to do whatever the hell he wants with. And then the, the company's out of his hands and he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. I guess he just kind of lost passion for it. If I had to guess. So, I mean, the way you frame it, I think that this is more of a commendable maneuver rather than a condemnable one. Well, I don't, again, I, I, I don't know. Like this right. is, again, you said conjecture. I can't emphasize that enough. I don't actually know why he's selling it. Maybe right. that's just me trying to imagine that he is a better guy than we actually think he is. <laughs> that's certainly true. So I'll, I'll paint it like this. I'll paint it like this. If your conjecture, again, emphasis big time there is on point and it's just that he doesn't want to have the connection like i I get it i have to relinquish the the reins which is funny because you know roman reigns and you know whatever (laughs) (laughs) but uh strange too though because like you have to wonder are they going to maintain all of the writers and this new company is just going to have like the rights of the company and final say or are they going to do like a clean out and we're going to get a whole new writing staff or like, you know, like what exactly is going on there? And my kind of immediately what comes to my mind is I know WWE has been bad, but it's not like it can't get worse. We've seen WCPW. It gets a lot worse. <laughs> All right. Well, let, let's have a little fun with this because we're already on a train of conjecture. You and I have no idea the objective motivations or circumstances of any of this all we know again is that sound bite that you deliver to us if you are the danish buyer so pretty much putting your mind in these buyers what would you do would you clean the writers out and start fresh or would you just oh the man you have? i don't know i would probably hire freaking consultants that know what they're doing to actually help me do what i want to do i mean that sounds sensible <laughs> i mean if you've got the like and if you've got enough money to buy the wwe I'm pretty sure you can spare a few extra hundred thousand bucks for a few consultants that know what the hell they're talking about in the wrestling business. Like go hire, even if they don't get along with each other, like go hire. Okay. First of all, Paul Heyman has got to be on that list. JR has got to be on that list. I would say Cornette and Russo, but maybe they would get at each other's throats so much that you couldn't afford both of them. In which case I would say hire Russo over Cornette. Yeah. And I mean, for me personally, just to chime in, if you don't want people that are necessarily like, I mean, you should definitely have people that are in the business, but if you just want really passionate people about I the mean, business, if they're really wanting to throw their money around, they could always hire the Lucha Underground writers if they really wanted to. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of hoping the Lucha Underground writers can't be bought. But I mean, there are numbers that companies like this could throw around that I wouldn't even be able to blame them for taking. You know what I and, mean? And somewhere Ted DiBiase Sr. is laughing. Um, but I mean, <laughs> everybody's I would... got a price. I would even throw out, I was even going to say, like, and I'm, I'm being a bit serious about it. Again, if you didn't want somebody so, like, deep in the know, if you wanted another type of person, I, I would go to Max Landis and be like, look, we'll fund any movie you ever want to make, but you've got to give creative pitches for the product here. So, yeah, get a guy like Max Landis on board, too. See, I don't think that that would necessarily work, though, because Max Landis is more ideas just kind of come to him rather than someone tells him what to write and he writes it. Right, right. I see what you're saying. Yeah. But yeah, I think also just getting really passionate people about the business, even if they have no like internal experience, that's a good thing too. We've seen passionate people writing a wrestling show and it doesn't always work. 
I guess. I just think a good blend, because I think when you get too many people that have been in the business, egos tend to dominate. So I think, again, you shouldn't have, like, all people that are outside the business. Certainly you should have some insiders, but I wouldn't want them dominating the kitchen, because that just seems ugly to me. Honestly, I I mean, at this point, if they could pay him enough money, I think Paul Heyman could probably run the entire show by himself. Probably. I mean, everybody says his Achilles heel was always the financial aspect. If somebody right. independent so, of him is taking care of that. Yeah, like if somebody else is paying him and everyone else and he just happens to be on a payroll, but he's doing the writing for the shows, I think that would be a pretty amazing solution. But again, this is all conjecture. We don't even know if there's going to be any kind of turnover or if the company just wants to you know, make an investment and reap whatever income that the WWE generates over the next however many years. Right. So we'll see. All right. So with that, high spots and low shots. And low we shot. can't include any of this news in our high spots and low shots. So your high spot can't be Randy Orton. <laughs> All right. All right. That's fair. I didn't even need him okay. because my low shot is Titus O'Neil. Uh, yeah. You failed. You're always a failure. <laughs> Much like so many other people on this planet that I laugh at on a regular basis. You suck. Go home to your children and cry. So <laughs> Titus O'Neil is my low shot. That was commendable. All right, who who's your low shot? The Vaudevillains, for reasons you listed earlier. And there you go. Yeah. Uh, I spot Kevin Owens, because much like failures, I like associating with winners, and he was one of the biggest winners on this show. Despite his team losing the match, you know, at least he didn't get pinned. He only got uh, lost his match on his own power because he hates Sami Zayn so much. Not that I can blame him. I mean, have you seen that face? So, yeah, Kevin Owens is totally my high spot. My high spot, I mean, my low shot was a tag team. Might as well keep that momentum going. My high spot is going to be Enzo and Cass because they won in a, basically a squash match. And more importantly, they got added to a freaking John Cena main event angle with AJ Styles and the Bullet Club. Yeah, you can't get any higher than that unless you're hitting a bong. So I completely agree with that yeah. choice. Yeah, I mean, so... RVD's been higher than that plenty of times, but it's a different kind. Exactly. So with that said, let's move on to our next segment, Raw Request. And uh, I guess my Raw Request, let's see. You know what? I'll I'll tell you what my Raw Request is. Really make Enzo and Cass feel important in this final push to Battleground. Because I don't think this is the go-home show coming up. I think we have two weeks left before Battleground. But now that you've tacked them on to this uh, John Cena Bullet Club feud, really make them feel like a part of the feud and not just associating with John Cena, like just having his back. I'd like to see them get mic time. I'd like to see them mix it up with AJ and Anderson and Gallows. Uh, You know, I think you could do some really fun things here now that Enzo and Cass are in the mix and you've already put your foot on the gas. I just want them to go full throttle. So that's my real request. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And by the way, I believe you are right because the way I remember it is that Roman Reigns' suspension will end the Thursday or Friday before Battleground. Right. And he was suspended on June 21st, and it was a 30-day gig, so July 21st would be the final day. So July 24th is the Sunday that Battleground is on. Uh, okay, there you go. So there you go. Uh, my raw request, though, is you know, not quite as straightforward as yours. Just kind of in general, I like that we had two women's matches tonight, but I want the women's matches to get more time. I mean, that whole hashtag give divas a chance thing happened because of how short the women's matches were getting. And now it feels like we really haven't made any progress in that category at all. Uh, No, you know, it's funny because if we had been making progress... I'd be hopeful that Sasha Charlotte for SummerSlam would be like a 15 to 20 minute affair at SummerSlam. I, I mean, the women get a decent amount of time. It's not ideal, and I agree with you that they should be 15 plus, but they get okay time on pay-per-views. And frankly, another thing that I would like to add to my raw request is to ha- not be afraid to have more than one women's match on the pay-per-views. Um, but really, just the women's matches. I mean, two is... I guess acceptable, but as long as they're more than three minutes long each, you know? Right. I mean, ideally, if you got two on there, it'd be nice if you had one that was like a seven or eight minute kind of competitive exhibition style match. And then like an actual like 12 to 15 minute match where it's competitive and both people get over. Yeah, absolutely. Like, look, 
WWE has a, a great women's division in my mind right now. You know, there are talents in NXT like Bailey and even, you know, lower card talents there that I feel like could be an asset. And just on the main roster alone, you've got great talent that both is being mined currently in a way and yet hasn't even really been uh, tapped into as far as their full potential goes. So, I mean, there's a lot going on there and you could use all that to give these really compelling storylines and matches. And they're just like, I think they... I don't even want to say that they want to commit because it seems so like a lukewarm commitment, if you will. Like, oh, we'll call it a revolution, but we really won't do anything to solidify it. Whereas I've said multiple times, one soundbite that I've said repeatedly on TwitWow is Lucha Underground never even had to say that, oh, we're having a women's revolution. They just picked up their guns and they had one from day one. So, you know, WWE can do it, too. It's just a matter of you've got to commit to it. The thing is, Lucha Underground didn't even need to revolutionize. They started on the right foot. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. Like, and, and you're right. Like, it wasn't even something that needed to be fixed. They just knew from the get-go, oh, well, women are talented, too, so we can totally do this. Yeah. And they didn't make a big deal out of it. Well, I mean, Stryker did it first, but you get what I mean when I say they didn't make a big deal <laughs> yeah, out of it. Yeah, yeah, right. The like, writers, yeah. Exactly. Like, they're not like, oh, my God, we're so revolutionary. No, it's like, yeah, women are competent. Women are capable. Let's fucking do it. So. Look at these two adults fighting each other. Did you know that their genders are opposite? Oh, my God. Exactly. You, you hear how stupid it sounds when he says it? Like, now just picture how stupid it is when it's actually a dominant idea in a writer's room. Fuck's sake. All right. Um, anything else you want to say about your oral request? Nope. All right, then. Last segment of the night, 32nd Hot Seat. So what have you got for me this week? You know, your delivery is getting a little bit better each time. I appreciate it. I know. It's like you're starting to accept that it's a thing. I know. What do you got? <laughs> I know. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> so uh you're gonna love this oh i hope i do all right so the final two sort of survivors in tonight's elimination match were zach Ryder and the big show so my question to you john is what are zach Ryder and the big show going to be doing on next week's edition of monday night raw you have 30 seconds and your time starts now want to be a dick so bad but i'm gonna answer this question legitimately i think big show's gonna continue to be a kind of coach to apollo cruz maybe because sheamus did eliminate him uh and as far as zach Ryder, i'll be honest i wouldn't be surprised if we saw cesaro versus zach Ryder, winner faces miz or rusev at battleground it's gonna be for one of the mid-card titles i don't know which but i could totally see that happening okay and that was only 22 seconds very impressive and you know i don't even disagree with anything you said so let's finish this off all right, guys. So you have no concluding remarks you want to make then? I'm just eager to get this thing up and listen to this episode of Under the Mat Radio. And, and you know what? It's a, it's a hybrid. They they There are two separate podcasts. One's Under the Mat Radio. One is the Way Too Real podcast. And they usually are separate. But tonight, because of this huge news, they did a combined supercast, I guess. Ooh, supercast. All right. Well, I, I just made that up. Well, there you go. Um, with that said, guys, this has been Raw. This has been Twit Wow. The best wrestling podcast made for wrestling fans by wrestling fans on the web today. I'm John. That's my cohort and commentary, Ashton. Guys, be sure to comment and subscribe on YouTube. You know that the question down below in the comments is the 30-second hot seat for Raw Reviews. So what are Big Show and Zack Ryder going to do on next week's Raw? And for anybody that says Zack Ryder's going to get pushed off a stage in a wheelchair, I love you. I love you so much, and I know who you are. So you guys already know all the stuff you're supposed to do given the background, and we will see you again. We have got a stacked week because we have got Prince, PWG Prince, live reactions coming at you tomorrow. And then Wednesday, it is Lucha Underground, Ultima Lucha Dose, Night One, live reactions, and then followed up by a more formal and substantive review. It is going to be absolutely amazing. Can't miss. So until then, guys, tune in and peace out.